engineer, I've worked on technologies that are used for measuring sleep and for measuring respiration. And I now work with a company called ResMed, which makes therapies for treating a sleep disorder called sleep apnea, which I'll discuss. So if I, if I can get anything across in my talk today, it's to get this picture maybe in your brain and see if we can persuade people to talk a little bit about the bit in here. So everyone here would agree for certain that if you want to be healthy, you have to eat right. I think we'll all agree on that. The question is, do we have to sleep? Is sleep important? And you will hear people say, I don't need sleep. I can get by in four hours a night. It's, it's fine. It's no problem. I'll sleep when I'm dead. Is that correct? Uh, is sleep important? Or is sleep just something you, you fills in a few hours in the day? So I would argue right now, this is where we are in terms of people's understanding of health and what makes a healthy life. Diet, exercise, yes. Sleep, well, maybe. So let's think a little bit about sleep. So first thing I'd say about sleep as a, uh, from a science point of view, it's remarkable how ubiquitous it is. So if you go throughout the animal kingdom, you will find all sorts of animals that you wouldn't expect do actually have some sort of sleep behavior. All the way from little C. elegans, which is a, a beautiful nematode, uh, has been observed to do whatever worms do when they sleep. Uh, little kangaroo there having a happy, happy time, obviously the human. Our good old drosophila friend, again, for those of you that are in, in, uh, in genetics, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Uh, they, they too have their sleep periods. The only question, and this is where you will get a lot of controversy if you go to a sleep conference, is people say there's a bullfrog that doesn't sleep. I don't know. It's very hard to measure sleep in a bullfrog. But that's, right now, that is the candidate for the only animal that doesn't sleep. So we'll find out maybe in a few years if, 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 those, if those readings are correct or not. Some animals have particular problems about sleep, and they've come up with some pretty smart ways to get around it. So the dolphin has a particular problem because it lives underwater, but it doesn't have gills. So it has to stay awake enough to sleep, uh, to breathe. So how does it achieve that? It does a clever trick where basically half its brain goes to sleep and half its brain stays awake to keep breathing. So that would be a nice trick for us to be able to do. Unfortunately, the dolphin and maybe some birds are the, ones who, the only ones who can pull that off. So that's called unihemispheric sleep and a very nice trick in nature to make sure you can sleep and not drown at the same time. You would imagine that science by this point would know why do people sleep or why do animals sleep? And you'd think it'd be done, done and dusted maybe in the last century. Reality is we still don't know why animals sleep. So the three kind of prime theories right now are energy conservation. So the concept there, if you're a bat and the insects you eat only come out at dusk for a few hours, you know, don't waste your energy flying around all day looking for flies. They're not going to be there. So you might as well do go into this sort of semi-dormant state for the day. So that's the energy conservation theory. The second one is the repair theory. So, you know, things happen during the day. You, you run around. You've got metabolism going on. At some point, the, the cells need some downtime to repair themselves. So that's the second theory that people put out there about why animals sleep. And the third one, which is quite intriguing, maybe we think might only apply to higher animals like ourselves, but even in, in the lower animals, which have more simple nervous systems, is that perhaps uh, sleep is required so that the nervous system of an animal can do kind of a, a, a dress rehearsal of its activities to sort of memorize and learn patterns. So um, if you can disconnect your actual physical body from your nervous system while you're doing that, that might be a good idea so you don't act out too much. So right now, I think those are the three prominent theories as to why animals sleep. But to be honest, if you go to a sleep conference, we don't know. We honestly don't know why animals sleep. And maybe it's some combination of all of the above. Or maybe there's something out there which we still haven't yet figured out. So just to show a little bit, here's different strokes for different folks. Different animals will sleep quite a lot of different amounts. So you can see all the way from animals like a giraffe, which only sleeps two hours a day, all the way up to the bat, which I say we could explain as being, don't waste your time chasing insects when it's, when it's bright outside. There should be some pattern there, but it's not necessarily very clear. For example, if you're an animal that eats grass, you probably need to be awake quite a lot because it takes a lot of time just to get through all that grass. If you're a higher order predator like a lion, you can probably get away with a lot of sleep because you, you, you want to strike uh, in short bursts. So that's in general maybe a bit of a pattern there, but there is quite a variety of sleep times across different animals, and it doesn't really fall into a very easy pattern to, to figure out. So where do we fit in? So eight hours, we're kind of maybe slightly below the average for, for some of the, uh, certainly some of the mammals. Uh, we're in there with the rabbit, so that's good, I think. Um, so let me say a little bit more then about human sleep and some of the specifics of human sleep. So some of you might have seen this type of diagram before. It's called a hypnogram. So basically what you have here is you start out awake, and then you go through various stages of sleep, which are called stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. 
which are respectively deeper and deeper stages. We then have this special phase called REM, rapid eye movement, which is also associated with the dreaming state of sleep. And you go through these sort of 90 minute cycles where you go deeper, 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 then come out to REM and then back into deeper sleep again, if things are going naturally and well. And it's generally thought that the deeper stages of sleep are pretty important for physical and mental recovery, and that the, the REM certainly seems to be associated with better uh, memory performance and cognitive uh, regeneration. So all the aspects of sleep are important, but in particular, the deep sleep seems to be particularly important for, um, for recovery. So certainly people who are sleep deprived, the first thing they will do when they're sleep deprived and you let them sleep is they'll go straight quickly into that deep sleep phase quicker than normal. So how do we find out whether a person's asleep or not? So this is the, uh, the very, very elegant way of finding out if people are asleep or not right now. So it involves going into a sleep laboratory and getting your head full of these little sticky tapes which are called electroencephalograms. They measure your brain waves. And your brain waves do lots of funny things during the night. So what happened, in, particularly starting maybe from the 1940s, 1950s in the University of Chicago, and then taken on in various places, is people began to characterize the, the brain waves together with the state of sleep. And they came up with a bunch of what they called scoring rules, which determined the stage one, two, three, and four uh, that we discussed previously. So right now, if you want to find out if a human's asleep, this is actually state of the art. This is the kind of the gold standard as best we can. And even there, that's not really a true gold standard because sleep is not a black and white issue. As we all know, when you're falling asleep, you know, are you asleep, are you awake? It's a bit of a gray area. So even, even, the, uh, even a perfect sleep lab will never get exactly the same results if they take the same data from two people. Okay. So one of the things that I got interested in as an engineer is some of the things that maybe go wrong in sleep. So some of the items here, some of them are a little bit more esoteric. You might not have heard of them. Some of them evolve from anywhere. So insomnia is something that everybody probably has experienced at some point in their, in their time. And that obviously can be a problem for people. Um, snoring, very common disorder as well. It can usually be quite benign except for your partner. Uh, the one that I would have focused most on the last few years is a disease called sleep disorder breathing or sleep apnea. And what happens to sleep apnea is you are trying to breathe, but usually it's your upper airway uh, gets uh, constricted. So basically, you're breathing with your chest, but no air is coming in. And you can imagine that's not particularly good for your body. Your body likes to have a bit of air coming in and out, as you, as you know. So what I'm going to show you next is a person actually suffers from this disease, sleep apnea. And what you'll see at the beginning is they look like they're breathing, but actually, if you were measuring their airflow, which, which, which they are in, the, in this uh, experiment, there's actually no air getting into their lungs. So although they're making the little breathing movements, Nothing, nothing is actually happening for this man in terms of getting air into his body. Eventually what happens is his body will decide this is not, this is not good. His, his CO2 level is going up, his oxygen is going down, and his body will wake up, and you'll see him make a little recovery. And he'll make a few gasps to try and get his air back up again. And then he actually cycles right back into one of these apneas a second time, and then you'll see again a second recovery. So hopefully the video will work. So you can see the little movement. So he's trying to breathe. And now he's recovered and he's actually getting some breathing. And now he's, basically what's happening again is his airway is obstructed again. So he'll continue to try and move, but you won't hear any sound. What's happening is his oxygen is going down, his carbon dioxide is going up, and eventually his brain is going to notice this. And we'll have to see another recovery. And watch out for his, his eyes will open momentarily in the next section, which I'll discuss a bit more. Okay, so now, fortunately for this gentleman, his body has kicked in. To protect him, he started breathing again. So, the reason I wanted to point out this eyes opening is effectively what happened there is if you went, if you, when they're looking at his brain waves, this gentleman was actually woken up momentarily. So what's happened for him is he's never got into that deep stage of sleep that I was discussing earlier. So he, when he wakes up in the morning, he does not feel rested. He feels really, really tired for no apparent reason. As far as his conscious brain is concerned, he's been asleep for six or seven hours. But in reality, he's never really reached the, the proper stage of sleep for recovery. So he is going to feel absolutely shattered the following day. That's why he's ended up in the sleep lab, because he's gone to his doctor, and his doctor has been smart enough to realize this is, this is what's going on. 
So what, what's happened to this gentleman here is the airway at the back, this is your base of your tongue airway. Humans have pretty small airways, relatively speaking, and it's quite easy for it, to get to, for it to get blocked. So if your tongue falls backwards, this is the airflow for a normal person, but if your tongue falls backwards, it begins to get narrow and you have what's called a, a partial obstruction and the airflow gets a bit limited. In some people, if you have kind of floppy tissue at the back, the air is still coming in, but it's vibrating the tissue, so you get the snoring, the <laughs> sound. So that's very common. And then what happened for this poor man is he actually had a complete obstruction. So he's getting no air into his, into his lungs. So that's called an apnea. And I say the only way his body can deal with that is actually to wake him up to provide the muscle tone to open up his airway again. So if we track his, his uh, breathing effort, you can see here, that was the little short one at the beginning and then the longer one. Basically, he's breathing up and down, and then this is actually measuring the movement. So there's still some effort going on, but there's no air getting in. And what's happened to his oxygen? His oxygen is starting out high, it's coming low, and eventually that will force a, uh, a wake up, and the person will start breathing again. So this is, this is what sleep apnea is, and I say it's a very common condition. So anywhere between 4 and 20%, depending on how you define the severity of it. And the way, it's the, the way severity is defined is how many of these events per hour does a person have. So this gentleman here might be literally having 60 events an hour. You saw how he went breathing, stop, breathing, stop, all within the course of about a minute. So he's having a lot of events every hour. So he will benefit from some treatment. So what are the problems of sleep apnea? Well, there's really two problems. The sleep apnea people, are, they're, inadvertently, they're a danger to others, not through any malice, but because they're so tired. So these are some of the examples of some of the really, really bad transportation accidents that have happened where it turns out the person had sleep apnea afterwards. And that because they had sleep apnea, they were sleepy and they fell asleep in, in charge of the ship or in charge of the plane or in charge of the train. So that's a, that's a big public health issue for people with sleep apnea. You really want to make sure that they're treated and recognized so that they don't drive uh, in, in a dangerous situation and, and they're aware of, of their limitations. And if you're treated, you can, come up, you can overcome this quite easily. It also affects the person themselves. So this is uh, what they call a survival curve. And crudely speaking, basically, we'd all like 100% survival over 10 years. So our probability of survival we'd like should be one. Uh, but this is a particular cohort, cohort of patients who are a little bit older and have some cardiovascular disease. What you can see here, though, is that the people who are, let's say, the normal population have a much higher level of probability of surviving than the people who have more than 30 events an hour. So the more sleep apnea you have, the less likely you are to survive 10 years in this case. So it's a very uh, measurable phenomenon. If you have sleep apnea, you, you do have a risk to your underlying cardiovascular health. So it is something that's worth looking at and treating. If you get into the more of the science of it, it turns out that sleep apnea is associated with a lot of other diseases. So if you look at people who have heart failure, people who have hypertension, people who have had diabetes, they all have very high rates of sleep apnea. So obviously, from a science point of view, the question is, does the hypertension cause the sleep apnea? Or does the sleep apnea cause the hypertension? And so on. And again, one of these things, you imagine people have it all figured out by now, but the reality is we don't. So basically, the way you solve sleep apnea, it doesn't look too pretty, but it works really, really well. You take a small little pump, you create some air pressure, and you blow it into the person's airway. Very simple concept, very elegant, and it works like a charm. So Colin Sullivan, uh, a, a doctor and engineer in the University of Sydney, he was the pioneer in this area, created the first version of this out of a, a leftover uh, spare vacuum cleaner. And uh, from that has spawned a whole uh, industry and medical practice around the treatment of sleep disorder breathing. Uh, so very, very successful treatment. Here's, uh, for those of you that are the, a medical background, here's a very nasty disease, heart failure, congestive heart failure, which is usually something towards the end of life. And We've, we have some studies where people have been treated with, with sleep, uh, CPAP versus not treated, because at the point at the time wasn't proven as a useful treatment. And you can see the difference here. These are the people who are untreated. Their survival or their event-free rate is much lower than the people who are treated. I'm going to change gear. My last, the last thing I got excited about sleep, which is also uh, very topical right now, is basically what's the relationship between sleep and body mass index or obesity? So does sleep have any effect on the rest of our lives? So th there's this very interesting study was done where, we where there was a correlation between people's body mass index and the amount of sleep that they reported every night. And for those of you who are not familiar, body mass index, the bigger it is, basically the more obese you are. So you would like to be 25, 26 would be you know, acceptable. 
Some of these people here, these are slightly more obese people, and it's correlated with only six hours of sleep. So it seems like, everyone says get your good eight hours a night, it seems like there might be some basis in fact for that. That the people who are most likely to be closest to an ideal BMI tend to have about seven or eight hours of sleep. If you go too far the other way, maybe you're also not doing so well, and that might be because there are other underlying conditions going on. So basically, there's two, uh, well, there's more than two, but at a simple level, there's two hormones that control how hungry you feel. There's ghrelin, which apparently is ghastly because it makes you hungry, and there's leptin, which makes you feel satisfied. So if you've got lots of ghrelin, you're likely to go for the Big Mac. That's the theory anyway. So what happens if you take a person, a perfectly normal person, these are uh, university volunteers, and you actually deprive them of sleep? But what happens is their leptin level, this is the normal, and this is after two days of four hours sleep. Their leptin level baseline goes down, their ghrelin level goes up. So effectively, and I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with this, if you don't sleep well, you wake up the following morning, you're pretty hungry. And you tend to go for the donut, you go for the Big Mac, rather than the solid. And there is actually a physiological reason behind that. So there is possibly some good science behind why low, poor sleep might actually contribute to obesity as well. Okay? And here's a final uh, a, a slide, is basically that uh, did a very fascinating experiment where they took healthy volunteers for six days and sleep deprived them and saw, looked at whether the glucose response changed. So those of you who are familiar with diabetes, it's, it's all to do with how you process glucose. And even by taking a normal healthy volunteer and depriving them of sleep for six days, so they only have four hours a night, after six days, the take-up rate of glucose is a lot slower than in the normal baseline condition. So again, there's physiology which showing if you don't sleep well, it can also potentially make you pre-diabetic. Um, so that's a, a very, very hot area of topic right now across the world. Okay, so to finish off, if you take three things away from the, from the, the talk, basically, firstly, sleep is ubiquitous. It's not just humans and dogs, but all across the animal kingdom. And it's not fully understood. So we don't really know what's going on and why people sleep and why animals sleep. The second thing, if you take away, if you've never heard it before today, there's a disease called sleep apnea. It is important. It's quite common. Four or five percent of adults might have it. And it can have a very bad effect on your health and the health of others. And then the final thing, which I think is a very exciting area in sleep right now, is the link between poor sleep and possibly uh, uh, poor control of your metabolism. So maybe there's a link between appetite, uh, sleep uh, links to appetite and weight. So I'll finish up there. Sleep well. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.